So settling in, just finding a comfortable posture, one that's relaxed and still alert. And we can hold some interest, curiosity about all that's arising in this present moment. And you might choose to close your eyes or lower your gaze. You might be comfortable turning off your camera or just physically turning your, your body away from your camera for this meditation. Allowing the nervous system to settle. And feeling the weight of the body sitting or standing or lying down. In contact with the earth, perhaps the feet, or if you're lying down, the shoulders, the buttocks. Perhaps sensing into the energy drawn up from the earth, from our ancestors. Holding us tenderly here in this moment of practice, this moment of awareness. Setting aside our busyness and doing. Interested in staying present just right now, just this moment. Allowing what's past to rest there. No need to ruminate or recall, replay a conversation or scenario. At least right now. We commit to bringing our full awareness to the body and the stillness settling. You might anchor your attention in this transition to the breath. Perhaps at the subtle entry of breath at the nostrils. And perhaps bringing attention to the rise and fall of the belly that follows the rhythm of the breath. Allowing the body to be soft, the joints to be loose, just feeling the weight of the arms falling from the shoulders.
awareness of any tension in the shoulders or neck. And we often carry so much stress. Just breathing in, ease. Breathing out, release. Releasing tension, it's not needed right now in this moment. Relaxing the jaw and the forehead. Breathing in ease. Breathing out release. Softening. There's no problem here. Everything belongs. Physical sensations. Sounds. Perhaps a lingering taste or scent in the air. Thoughts arising and passing. Meeting all the activity of being a human being with tenderness. With a patient curiosity. The deep care and kindness.
when the heart mind is balanced in this way we feel the tension that arises when we withhold this care this kindness from another Feeling the fullness of the heart. And this offer is unrestricted. Wishing well. all beings and sharing that all beings are happy and peaceful safe and protected. Healthy and strong. Sanju Earthland Manual offers these words breaking down this intention for happiness and well being for all beings. May all beings be cared for and loved, be listened to understood and acknowledged despite different views. Be accepted for who they are in this moment. Be afforded patience. Be allowed to live without fear of having their lives taken away or their bodies violated. May all beings be well in its broadest sense. Be fed, be clothed, be treated as if their life is precious. Be 
be held in the eyes of each other as family. May all beings be appreciated. Feel welcomed anywhere on the planet. Be freed from acts of hatred and desperation. including war, poverty, enslavement, and street crimes. May all beings live on the planet housed and protected from harm. You have what is needed to live fully without scarcity. Enjoy life living without fear of one another. Be able to speak freely in a voice and mind of undeniable love. May all beings receive and share the gifts of life. Be given time to rest, be still, and experience silence. May all beings be awake.
not needing to exclude anyone from these wishes for living well, being well, happy and cared for. And we become aware of the constriction that results from withholding or limiting, othering, judging who is deserving of this goodness. This care. And we can lean into the joy, contentedness that arises. Uh, and we extend these wishes to all beings. And you need not agree with their politics or all of their decisions. that we can wish for them that they be well, that they be safe, housed and fed, without harassment or hatred directed their way.
And slowly beginning to turn our awareness outward as we prepare to invite the sound of the bell. Take a moment, shake it out, stretch it out. Take a sip of water or tea. Welcome again, everyone. I have really uh, appreciated uh, that metta practice from Sanju Earthlin Manual. And she points directly to uh, all of those, the foundations for well being and happiness. Uh, it's not just this broad, random um, wish nebulous for happiness, but we, she really just breaks down you know, what, what that means. And we're talking about the decisions that we make collectively, individually, the actions that have deep impact on people's lives and well-being. And we know, right? Our actions have effects. If you're mean and you cheat at games or on your partner, then you may become a mean cheating person. Right? Conversely, if we are kind, generous, compassionate, then we become these open hearted people. Right? So indeed we become um, who we become as the result of our previous actions. So I've been reflecting for several months, maybe more than a year on um, studying the paramis which is actually, and there's lots of lists in Buddhism, there's actually a list that was said to have been created long after the Buddha's death. Um, as monks and um, practitioners were um, just really grappling with how the process of, be of awakening, of becoming enlightened. And uh, while they were seen, people who were becoming awakened, it didn't seem to be to the same depth that was uh, taught that the Buddha had reached, reportedly. You know, he lived many lifetimes. And so the Paramis is a list of qualities, characters that any person, lay person, monastic, can cultivate um, to cross the great floods of life. Right? And the, the, the four floods, primary floods, are one of sensuality, becoming, views, and ignorance. And sensuality is, you know, the, the desire for pleasantness. Right? We look at all of the, the sense gates, right? We want pleasant smells. Mm -hmm. Approach a flower, right? Sometimes if you ever approached a flower and took a big, deep whiff, it was just, eh, 
<laughs> right? It wasn't a lovely, you know, aromatic wish that we had for the flower when we're looking out. You know, we want a view that's pleasant, right? Or we want to look at people on television. There's so much research, right? Right? Even our preference for a particular bird that's chirping. Right? Not the blue jays, they're loud and obnoxious, but the chickadees, they're much more pleasant to hear, right? All of these places where we want it to be good. Right? And then once we have a yard full of chickadees, even that becomes sort of normal, right? Oh yeah, it's just the chickadees. Then we want maybe something more exotic or different. So even the seeking for pleasant uh, is never fully satisfied, never fully realized. It's always out of our grasp. And a flood is, you know, this, this uh, getting swept away, being overwhelmed, right? Caught up, I like to say. We get lost in this idea, this view, which is one of the floods, that this experience should be, needs to be a particular way which inherently means that the way that it is, is broken and wrong. Right? And similarly with this, this idea of becoming, right? We get so uh, swept up, swept away in these worries and expectations about who I will be, remembering maybe nostalgically or with regret who I was or the ego comes into play oftentimes right well I've been this and thus and therefore I deserve to become you know, the, the promotion the boss the wife or the conversely, the, the negative side. Right? I've never been this, so I'll never be thus. I've never worked out. <laughs> I'll never be a professional athlete. Certainly that's an extreme. But there's just a lot of drama and suffering and stress in this flood. And sensuality and becoming they're hard to get away from. They're so hard to get away from. And so by reflecting on not only the flood and sort of where it's taking us, but this, this re relationship, this reaction, how we show up. And there's, I was trying to say moments of difficulty, but it's our life, right? We can step out of it at least long enough to find a path, right? Not one where we're just being swept along. And so by cultivating these paramis, and there are 10 of them, of course, it's a list, right? We, we steer, steering, setting our own course. Uh, so the, the paramis are uh, generosity, integrity, renunciation, wisdom. And uh, some of these you've, you've been practicing, you, they're familiar. They're sometimes on many of the, the paths. Energy, patience, truthfulness, resolve, kindness, or metta, and equanimity. And so these paramis provide um, sort of a template for 
the activity of the mind, the energies. And this isn't um, an add on to living and being human, engaged and doing all the things that we do, but it really is integrated in what we say, how we work, our relationships with other people, our interactions, whether it's with a partner or someone in the store, passing the sidewalk, and even in the, our, our times of just personal private reflection and how we make decisions and set our, set our own course. And so it's, it's this alternate way to orient the mind to breaking up those habitual responses that have been conditioned as a result of our upbringing, our socialization, and really using these paramis practicing in everyday activities at work when we're attending to the children or maybe even just stuck in traffic. And so all of those places where we're overwhelmed and overwhelmed by the suffering in our life or in the world as a result of impermanence, aging, sickness, and death. And so we show up, we attend to what is happening with wisdom, truthfulness, curiosity, this willingness to not turn away. And so the uh, third flood, this view, which we talk a lot about views in uh, Buddhism, is like one way of saying that is it's uh, these broad stroke generalizations we make, right, that help inform our decisions, who we're loyal to, our worldview, really just summing people up into groups. And that makes it, um, creates a dynamic where, of othering, right? Something we can either move close to and identify with or step away from. And that could be political views. It could be views about gender identity or gay marriage or laws about guns or your position on the police, right? And we can get really into the nitty gritty with our views, right? So the sentencing for Derek Chauvin was today, right? Well, of course he should, you know, these go to prison, his attorney is asking for probation. Many people, like, well, of course he shouldn't get probation. Also a view, right? Of course he should go to prison. Well, he should go to prison for a certain amount of time. And even after the verdict was read, there is a great deal of discourse. Like, well, yeah, he, he, he should go to prison, but that's not enough time, right? And I, I don't mean to pass judgment either way. It's just pointing to all of the places that we hold ourselves, right? get stuck in this view of how it should be. And these views, whichever side they fall on, are isolating, they're dividing, and often can draw a, a boundary 
across which we cease to be kind, cease to be generous, maybe even truthful, that we somehow establish a boundary where our own ethical standards and commitments don't apply. Right? Who's deserving of help? Who's not? And so this um, study of practice of cultivating the paramis is a remedy to look at these views as a starting place where we can question, investigate how they came to be, how they dictate our engagement with others and lead us to engage with others, right? These views become solidified when we don't open to one another, when we don't remain open to learning new information all of the time. And in this, we also acknowledge that we, we do indeed have a personal perspective, right? We, we can't avoid this, we're, we're human. Despite the good Buddhists that we aspire to be, right? No one can have an all-encompassing view. We can try. That is certainly the, the aim, right? But we, our perspective is derived directly from our lived experience, from our own course of, uh, chosen course of study. And the invitation is to remain open to learning that there is always something more to learn. So it said that the, the, the currents of or the floods of sensuality becoming and views are carried by uh, the strongest current in the flood is ignorance. Right? And that's that unwillingness to hear, see, differently than what we think, what we believe. And it undermines our capacity, our interest in investigating our experience. And under this influence, um, we can, we're more likely to blame the other, right? Attribute flaws or difficulties in our culture, in our communities to the other, right? Other groups. And not, um, yeah, not exploring how this came to be this view. So I thought we'll just uh, take the time, however much time, weeks or months, I'm only here once a month, to look at these practices, the paramis, as meta in action as a way to really bring this care, this well wish for well-being and happiness. Like that these are qualities of character that we can all cultivate to really enact that. I don't know about you, but I I have struggled and certainly much more earlier in my practice to really understand how uh, this very well-intentioned practice of sitting on my cushion and radiating out 
happiness and peace and ease would really transform the world. A world that I often experienced as hostile and divisive. I, ca I stayed with it and certainly recognized my own heart beginning to transform. And so then how I show up is the trans transformative element in this change of the world. All right, so this own, this mind, this heart, Yeah, when I think about when I think about uh, generosity, like all of the ways when I think of it, blah blah blah. blah. <laughs> I'll start over. Uh, when we often talk about generosity, there's the Dana talk, right? If you can support the teacher, support the center, and we think of generosity, oftentimes what we think about it, certainly in this culture, I think is the offering of something tangible, right? Give money, give food, give something to someone who has less. And I've been reflecting on this generosity as a, uh, a quality of my own character, right? So this generosity of listening can i when i'm talking with someone or listening to someone can i be generous with my attention generous with my interest right particularly when i'm listening to someone who whose opinions i don't necessarily agree with or maybe even that someone whose choices or lifestyle i don't agree with can i listen with the same care, the same interest as Zenju said, right? Like their family. And maybe that's not a fair analogy, right? Because we like, oh, I know you. Our family member, I know what you're going to do. I know what you're going to say. And can we set that down and genuinely be interested? And there's, a, I think, myriad of ways that we can cultivate generosity outside of this tangible offering. When we're, when I'm listening to someone, I'll admit it, I often prescribe where they're going, not only where they're going, what they're going to say. So then I have part of me that's I'm, I'm preparing my response, right? But I'm also assessing or judging their intention, their motive. Not trusting or having faith in what's being presented to me just as it is. And that's the, we, we, we commit to cultivating this equanimity, seeing things just as they are. And that means all of that narrative, all of that story, and sometimes even our direct experience with a person, right? Because our practice is to be present in this moment. And certainly not to be blind to someone who may cause harm or be threatening. Can we open to the person before us just as they are without the shadow? of history, not to ignore, not to deny, 
but to hold center what is arising right here and take ownership for our own and accountability for our own process of mind that is layering over this previous experience over this moment. And that can be really difficult to discern when we're carrying that residue of a previous interaction, a previous experience, and maybe not even directly with this person. Maybe it's just with a person <laughs> that reminds you of that. It feels familiar, a familiar pattern. And so we brace ourselves. And then that, in that way, how are we able to tune into or open to their intentions? And what's being centered is our own narrative and story. And so the, the other side of that then is being generous and our willingness to hear someone else's story or experience or opinion. And instead of being suspicious or judging or critical, can we assume that there is some validity to what's being shared? Can we assume that there is not ill will until it's made clear to us? That area, you all know what they say about assuming. <laughs> it's a dangerous, it's a dangerous zone. And we talk, we engage with people, many of us, most of us, much of our time, whether it's someone in our household, family members, friends, clerks. How, how simple can it be to be a bit more open, generous with our listening? Like you all are being very generous now, all right? You chose to show up here with some interest. Like can we bring this level of interest anywhere else or everywhere else? Let's, um, that's sort of a sticky place in Buddhism is uh, this metta, loving kindness and for all. And, you know, I, I certainly have from time to time get stuck on. Yeah, but, right? <laughs> yeah, but they did or they said or they might. And again, the offering by Zenju Earthland Manual, like, well, would I really want to deny someone housing or food to deny them their safety? These are all the foundations for happiness. Now, certainly we are each responsible for our path. Right? And we will encounter the consequences of the decisions that we make, the path that we choose. So our well-wishing, our offering for happiness and safety does not interfere with someone, any of us, experiencing the direct consequences of the choices that we make. Or that anyone makes. And can we genuinely 
generously offer wishes of happiness for even the person who we disagree with, whose choices maybe we even find despicable. I think it's true that unhappy people do despicable things. So can we wish, not only wish another happiness, but actually celebrate their happiness. Good and wholesome. I don't, but it doesn't have to be our happiness. I heard a teacher say once, you know, it's kind of like, you know, when you're walking your dog and your dog finds something on the ground and to eat, like I think they said a piece of bread and they're just happy, their tail is going and they're happy. Can you just be happy for your dog finding this unexpected special treat, right? You don't want to eat a piece of bread off of the ground or maybe anything at all off the ground. All right. But can we be happy for another person's happiness? Indeed, that is what mudita is. Delighting in another's joy. It doesn't have to be parallel with our beliefs. The thing that, that makes them happy does not have to make us happy in order to celebrate with them or for them. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think <laughs> this is, you'll get uh, Stacy here. I don't, those type of people, I think we are all those type of people. Like, I don't know what I would do and we can name the, the scenario where I wasn't cared for, I wasn't listened to, I wasn't regarded, I was ignored, I was abused. I, like all of the things, all of the conditions that come together for someone to cause great harm to another human being. I've always struggled with the term evil. I, 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 people do horrendous things to one another, horrendous. I, I, I am of the belief that everyone wants to be happy. Everyone wants to be happy. Now their path to that happiness may be convoluted, may be quite confused based on who was guiding them, their conditioning, a myriad of conditions. Is that evil? I don't. I don't know. There's a story of Angulimala, whose parents, I don't remember why they sent him away to um, school. This is a Buddhist story. Um, they sent him away to study with this teacher and other students. Um, and maybe there was some premonition about um, his outcome in life, he would be a horrible person. So they did everything they could to prevent that from coming to be. And some of his fellow students, oh, he was, a, he was a fantastic student. He was just a good guy. He did everything. He studied hard. He studied closely with the teacher. And his fellow students were haters. They did not appreciate that. He was sort of the teacher's pet and got a lot of attention. And so they took it upon themselves to plant some seeds of mistruth to the teacher. Oh, he's, he's out to get your seeds. Some say he's out to get your wife. You should look out for him.